All right, looks like I'm live. Sorry, a couple little technical issues. Nothing big. YouTube just kept freezing up. Must have been a lot of people trying to do the same thing I was doing today. And so, a little bit of frustration there. All right, just give me one sec. Okay, so I've got the quiz done, or uh, the quiz is posted, so it's just seven questions. It should be really pretty basic. Don't forget, you have a few sentences to write. Read a few documents, uh, pick two, explain how you would use it in uh, DBQ, and then for one of the two, give why they have that bias. Blank believes this because of historical content, purpose, or point of view. And don't forget, you have to cite the documents at the end of the sentence, put down doc one, doc two, whatever the document might be. And you should be working on the review packet. Uh, we will do a little bit of reading. I'm gonna go very slowly through the 1950s, but it uh, should be really basic through the 1950s. And, but we're gonna still really hit uh, the DBQs and this era. We are gonna do a DBQ next week. Uh, I'm gonna post the documents, uh, some helpful documents on, on the uh, dropping of the atomic bomb today, right after, right after I get done with this. And then I'm also going to put up some, uh, put up the DBQ. And the DBQ, you have all next week to write it, and the directions will be a little bit different. Remember, this one's gonna be a four paragraph one. And so I'll talk about that more. And it appears as though this is now working. I was just trying to get my little monitor set up so I can see that it was working. If everyone can hear me, that's good. All right, and there'll be a little bit of reading. Don't forget though, you have to write uh, a couple sentences and get that into me with HAP. And for a DBQ, I repeat, you need context. And that is events that happen around the same time. And that's why that review packet is so important. A good thesis statement a um, use four documents so two in each paragraph that show show the documents related to another fact a factual piece of information not they felt funny no something very particular that happened and show how that relates to your thesis and then in addition one more additional example in each paragraph of your outside information and then two sentences um, that explain how and so we'll talk more about that a little bit later. I just wanted to get back to this. So we went through the bombing campaign, strategic bombing, which knocked out the German Air Force, even though it was horrifically bloody. And I showed that... Uh... Am I in there? I'm going to... I always think I want to use my, uh, I need a bookcase, like I'm, I'm one of the, uh, like everybody who's on every news program, they have to have a bookcase, but my, my wife is working downstairs, so she has the bookcase there, so I am upstairs. And, so I don't have that, but I had to get a little bit of light, kind of, kind of got weird light, but I'd rather stand, it's just a lot easier for me to do. So let's get to, oh, then we went through the Battle of Kurtz, which broke the back of the Russian army, went through a lot yesterday. And a little bit about island hopping and the Japanese strategy to hold out for a negotiated peace and Casablanca, which was unconditional surrender. So after Kurtz, finally the Western Allies, especially Churchill, realized that Italy was not the soft underbelly, and the British finally acknowledged that they did what the Americans wanted to do. Where is my mouse? Cross, cross the English Channel, attack France, and open up a second front. A second front. Now, this is only, it's going to end up being on June 6th, 1944. They originally thought about May, but they needed a couple different weather features that all work out right. And the channel is really rough. The North Sea can be bitterly cold. And so they had to wait for the weather to get a little bit better. better. But this is only about 19 miles from Calais 
to London, or Calais to Britain. And that's where the Germans expected they would attack. That's where they built their best defenses. If you go to Calais today, which is right there, there's still some of these massive defenses there, these big cement blockhouses and bunkers. They're all still there because unless you literally blow it up by piece by piece with dynamite, they're not going to go away. And so what the Allies did is they did an amazing intelligence effort to absolutely convince the Germans they were going to attack here. And it worked better than anyone could have thought. Good? Anyone could have thought. The Germans were convinced well after D-Day that D-Day was only a diversion. And then, but the attack was decided to go here at Normandy. Now the Germans did defend that, but not as much as here. Where I'm making this little circle with the mouths, that was the extent of Allied fighter bomber cover. And so the invasion had to be within that area. And so they decided this would be the best spot. Long Beach, uh, potential for cities for harbors, but you notice it is further away from Germany. That's part of the reason why the Germans didn't think it was going to happen there. It will be in Normandy, so a lot longer um, channel crossing. But Operation Fortitude was the name of the plan to convince the Germans that they were going to land at, at Calais. And they made up fake tanks, fake planes, a fake U.S. Army led under dis a fake... Uh, I'm sorry, British and U.S. Army under disgraced General Patton. Remember, they feared Patton. And they made this first army group, this fake army, and the British or the Germans totally bought it. Here is one of the fake tanks. And these were more for show, but these rubberized tanks, they could move and place all over the place. Kind of place one in the open and then put a bunch of camouflage netting out with the idea being that one tank is out of the netting, but that must mean there's a lot of tanks underneath. They did the same thing with these fake planes. Doesn't look like a plane right there, but from the air, it looks like a Spitfire fighter. And the Germans completely bought it. The British are good at that kind of thing. And so, the plan was avoid the attack here. They bombed the heck out of transportation areas all behind here and then got ready to invade at Normandy. And I can't go into great details about this. The, the operation is going to be called Overlord is the nickname, but this is going to be known in history as D-Day. And D-Day will be June 6, 1944, but D had no special invasion, or no special meaning at all. And when I was in France, they had a bunch of things saying Debarkment Day, which means the day that the invasion happened. I've heard people tell me it meant Doomsday or something like that. No, all it meant was Day Day. D just meant day, as in day, D day is the important day where the invasion is going to land. The hour that they hit the beaches was H hour, and every invasion was a D day. So there were D days in Sicily, Italy, all across the Pacific, and in southern France. The D means nothing special. And this is the long beach at Normandy with one of these little maps made by somebody. And there were pretty heavily defended areas. But the middle, the middle right here of this long stretch of uh, the Cavatoes or the Normandy beaches, that is where the Germans defended the heaviest. The idea being that if they could hold the center, there'd be two isolated bit breach bridgeheads of the Allies and would be much more difficult for the Allies to expand from that bridgehead and easier for the Germans to beat back. And so that beach right here, and just by pure happenstance of where they were located in Britain, that would be an American beach. And they were codenamed, the two American beaches were Utah and then Omaha. And that would be the beach the Germans defended the heaviest. And then a British beach codenamed Gold, then Juno is a Canadian beach, and then Sword is another British beach. And that was the plan. And... This is relevant, and they did the same thing here. Juno, since it's kind of in the middle, that would be the heaviest defended area too. And then at night, they would drop paratroopers before the invasion to protect the flanks. This was a massive invasion. Thousands of ships, 10,000 airplanes, hundreds of thousands of men. It would be the biggest amphibious invasion up to that time and arguably the biggest ever. 
probably okinawa overall was bigger a little bit later in 45 even though it didn't have quite as many men had more ships and these are some of the british or the german beach defenses and these are guns that were in between omaha or i'm sorry omaha and gold beach these are beach defenses and you can see these are called hedgehogs and the idea was at high tide the same with these defenses right here landing craft would run up on them and sink the landing craft because they knew they had to use the landing craft over and over again and so the idea was this would force the allies to attack at low tide but at low tide meant a long beach open beach to go across and german guns would be in place to rake the beaches with machine guns and artillery so general dwight eisenhower and there he is with Pathfinders. Those are the first paratroopers who would land uh, right here. They would land and they would use big lights to try to mark the spots where next paratroopers would land. So these were the most highly trained, most daring, pretty, <laughs> pretty crazy guys uh, overall <laughs> to volunteer for this difficult mission. But Eisenhower was the overall Allied command in North America. You see him as Supreme uh, Commander of Sheaf. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. He is not commanded the uh, the Mediterranean. That's a British general, General Alexander. He so like Italy. He's command of all across France and Northern Europe. So of the American forces. So there's Bre Eisenhower right there. General Bernard Montgomery. I've mentioned it before. He'd be the actual commander of the invasion itself. He the British general would lead that, and the highest ranking U.S. general at least some ground forces, is Omar Bradley right here. A very competent, good, not, uh, not spectacular, but a very good general. And Eisenhower would be in overall command. Eisenhower had never been in combat, uh, but he was a very able staff officer and a protege of General Marshall. And so here's the invasion fleet sailing across. Originally, it was going to be on the 5th of June, which had low tide, and full moon. They need a full moon for the paratroopers to see something when they dropped at night. It was too stormy. There was a window and a storm, and they had decided to roll the dice and attack on the 6th. The Germans, thinking they would never attack in the storm, had actually, uh, had actually called down their defenses a little bit, which also helped the invasion. Here's the ships coming over. These are barrage balloons. Idea was to catch low um, flying German fighters, but there were virtually no fighters left. Because of the P-51 Mustang and other Allied fighters, they had swept the skies clean of German fighters. There were less than 100 German fighter planes in Western France, and only two German planes even made it over the beaches that day. Complete superiority. Here are a few of the American planes. Uh, uh, these are American and I just put American, but British planes too and Canadian planes. And you notice the very distinctive stripes on the wings of that P-38 Mustang right here or the P-47. You see it with the C-47 dropping paratroopers. That was to tell allies on the ground that those were allied planes. So they wouldn't shoot anti-aircraft guns or for like the bombers flying over right here, US or British fighters wouldn't think that they're that they're uh, German planes. And they had complete air superiority, air superiority. That's over Normandy. You can see the, the field, that's a great shot. So the paratroopers landed at night and they landed two American divisions, 101st and 82nd Airborne landed here and the British 6th Airborne Division landed here. And they were scattered. Uh, the planes got lost. The men did not form up. They did not get many of their objectives completely but they so surprised the Germans that it, they did protect the flank. And here are some members of the 101st Airborne. They captured a, Ger a, a German flag at a little place called St. Marie and Glitz. Now the paratroopers landed at night and then the, at, just at sunup, the invasion happened. These are British and Canadian forces right here. Uh, Canadians, Brits, Brits. And even though Juno Beach was held and very difficult to take, all three of these assaults seceded with not near the casualties they thought, but still over, a, over almost uh, 1,500 British and Canadian casualties. Oh, deaths, I'm sorry. 
but they didn't get as far as they had wanted to get. Their objectives were too ambitious. And here is a Utah beach, the furthest west beach for the Americans. And this too was not as well defended. They were able to take the beach relatively easy in advance inland and link up with the paratroopers. My grandfather was, this was actually the fourth US Infantry Division landed at Utah, but he was in the 90th Infantry Division. He was, uh, he was in the Signal Corps, so he was involved with laying down wire for telephones. Very dangerous job. He was a sergeant. And he landed that night at Utah Beach and would end the war in Czechoslovakia in May 1945. So he made it. He was wounded once. And Utah made it, but Omaha Beach was the most difficult. Now this picture, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see why it was so hard. Long flat beach and then high cliffs that the Germans heavily defended. And so the landing craft, which was supposed to get up to the beach, they came under such fire, they dropped them off 50 or 60 yards from the beach and the men jumped off into the water, sometimes neck deep with 100 pounds of gear. And if they were hit or they sunk or fell, they might drown. Omaha Beach would be hell on earth for about five hours. Here are some of the very famous paintings. Very few of the actual picture paintings, I meant pictures, or motion picture film was taken. Most of it did not survive. It got accidentally thrown overboard on one of the landing craft after the battle. A tragedy. Here are American forces huddled behind a few. They're called hedgehogs. Here they're advancing forward. These are amphibious tanks. It did not work very well. You can really see the cliffs. That is a great shot of him ducking in there. And one of the more famous ones of an American, uh, co uh, he's actually a Coast Guard man, who was the, the Coast Guard pot, the, were the ones who did the land, landing craft, who was being drug up to the shore. You can see the rocky Omaha Beach right there. Omaha Beach now is sand, and but it was pebbles then, big stones. The reason why is because American engineers, when they were clearing it off or get supplies on, they... They bulldoze all the, the uh, rocks away. Well, this map did not work as well as I thought, but all these sites right here, these little, that it, those are German bunkers or fortifications along the hilltop. And they pinned American forces down on the beach and they were being slaughtered on the beach. A few men were able to make it to what's called the seawall, this wall were to keep the ties from going, getting too far and huddled there, but they weren't getting off the beach. They had to get off the beach. Here's General Bradley, and that is him on D-Day. And he not only quit having reinforcements come, he was very close to pulling the troops out of Omaha Beach. But a few troops, and these are roads or pass up the, the cliff. They're just designated by that, by those big wide white lines. They on their own for the most part, infiltrated up the hill, snuck up the cliff in little groups, and one by one began to beat the Germans back. And that is actually for the British beach, but that's what the seawall looked like that they huddled behind. And by the end of the day, there are those are American troops marching up the cliffs right there, one of the most famous shots. Those are troops being unloaded at Omaha Beach. They held on, just a fingertip, just a edge of their uh, fingernail, fingernail hold on the beach hole, beach, but they were able to hold out and get up. And by the end of the day, the Germans could not push him back. Not near as many men as they had feared had died, but well over 1,500 Americans died, most on Omaha Beach. And D-Day was a success. And the big thing about this was, now the Germans not only have a legitimate second front to contend with, but now the Soviets won't have a free hand. The Allies are in play, and they will have a major voice. And as the war went on, because of the American resources and size, more and more is going to be an American commitment. There will be huge British forces. More and more French will be recruited, eventually a million French soldiers by 45, and a lot of Canadians, some Poles, some Norwegians, some Dutch, but Americans more and more made up the bulk of the forces. That is why the British agreed to have Eisenhower in overall command because the best choice by all logic would have been Montgomery. So we're gonna jump past this. And 
But the fighting in Normandy here turned out to be much more difficult than they thought, the fighting here. Here you can see the fields, and every field has what's called a hedgerow there. Okay, the hedgerows didn't show up as well as I thought it would, but it's hedgerows. And they just thought it'd be like hedges that separated the fields. Well, these hedges have been growing and then cut back, grew, cut back, filled with dirt for eight or 900 years. And there's a couple German soldiers behind a hedgerow. This is a hedgerow where they actually had to blow a hole in it. And these were about anywhere from four, but usually six to eight feet high. And they were like four or five feet, or I'm sorry, one or two feet thick, like forts. And it meant that every single field was a little fortification for the Germans that they could hold out. Tanks could not go through it. Tank shells would, bounce, would just kind of be embedded into the mud. They would literally have to blow it up or come up with a kind of specially designed bulldozers to run through the hedgerows. And so that meant every field was a fort and it took much longer as the Germans poured in every reinforcements they could. And one more, one of the biggest secrets of the war that they kept secret from the American public the Americans were told that their Sherman tank, this is the Sherman tank here, and these are uh, Canadians on a Sherman tank, writing Russian style. They were told that the American Sherman tank was a, more than a match for the German tanks. No, it was not even close. The low velocity guns on the Sherman tanks bounced, bounced off the modern German tanks, and while German guns went right through their armor and the Sherman tanks had a gasoline engine. And so I think you know what happens when gasoline's hit by a shell. The only way they could beat the German tanks if, um, if there were more than one or two German tanks and these are, uh, these are Tiger I tanks, which broke down a lot, but heavy armor, massive tanks with a big 88 millimeter gun. And this is a German Panther tank, probably the best tank of the war. But they were unreliable, and remember partially because, as I told you before, the slave labor. They had to get behind and hit the rear armor or just overwhelm them. They kept this secret from the American public, and they really didn't start producing a tank that could match up with the Germans till the end of 44. They had an upgun Sherman, and then eventually in 45, a tank called the Pershing. But this was a big secret. While this is going on, on July 20th, 1944, there was one of many assassinations attempt on Adolf Hitler, and this one came as close as possible, the July 20th plot, where a group of officers who were also rapidly anti-communist, and don't think in terms of they want to create some kind of democracy, but they wanted a military dictatorship ship to end the war or maybe just focus totally on the Soviets. They tried to blow up a bomb in Hitler's bunker in what's called the Wolf's Lair, which is what uh, which was in East Prussia, which is today Poland. And it would be carried by a wounded war hero named Klaus von Stauffenberg, who had lost an eye and uh, um, part of uh, a part of his arm. In, in combat and was horrifically wounded. So he was this war hero and seen as this, this the, the epitome of a German officer. But he carried this bomb and placed it under this big heavy table in the Wolf's lair where Hitler was at. Well, somebody moved the bomb right before it exploded and the big heavy table took much of the shock and even though Hitler would be horribly wounded, he survived and the plot failed. And here he is afterwards. He was basically being kept or kept going, especially after this assassination, by painkillers and a cocktail of uh, barbiturates at night to put him to sleep and amphetamine, amphetamines during the day. And we're not going to worry about the actual, too much more about the attack, but when the assassination failed, this led to a massive purge of anyone involved in the assassination or any potential enemies and also kind of showed that Hitler was going to fight to the end. They had these huge show trials right here. Schaffenberg would be uh, assassinated when he tried to make it to Berlin and set up a puppet government right away. And then many of the assassins would be brutally murdered on meat hooks that would put, they put piano wire. 
So you see the piano wire nooses, and this would be slowly strangulated, but as they twisted on it, the piano wire would begin to cut their head off. A horrific uh, torture to death of those who committed the assassination. Well, while that's going on, finally the Allies broke out. They broke out of Normandy. The Germans put all their best forces to stop the, Br uh, the British and the Canadians around the city of Caen. And when the Allies finally took the rest of this peninsula and included a massive carpet bombing, a lot of bombing right here, they finally broke out of the German lines and got behind. Here are Allies on the advance. That's actually right here. And these are American tanks on the advance. And the left, that's American tanks going by destroyed German tanks. They broke out and got to the enemy rear and surrounded the Germans at Fallis. And it's right here, a place called the Fallis Gap. This map did not work as much as I wanted, but the Americans came this way and the British and the Canadians came this way. And as Germans tried to escape here, Allied air forces apps and artillery devastated the fleeing Germans, killing tens of thousands on the road. And you can see German tanks being destroyed right here. Here are German supply trains and notice all the horses that were killed because most of their supply was still brought up by horse. And here are British Typhoon fighters that were probably the best, one of the two best ground attack fighters of the war, just destroying the Germans. And this devastated the Germans. They lost almost 300,000 men and they began just fleeing. Once the breakout happened, France would be liberated very quick. This would be in the middle of August. And just a few days later, they would break out and Paris would fall. It would be right here that George Patton would be given command again. Remember I mentioned Patton before? They finally said one more shot and he would be given command of the Third Army. And some of you might see my shirt I'm wearing. This is a shirt for the Third Army baseball team called the circlers and because this was the symbol of the third army and so they would play they they had <laughs> baseball teams either they were combat soldiers would come back and play but a few of the units had like specially made up baseball teams a lot of the players on it were major leaguers who were either drafted or volunteered for the army before the draft took everybody they played major league baseball once they found out they played major league baseball they said hey would you like to get out of combat a little bit and play baseball put on these expeditions, exhibitions for the soldiers who were on leave. And so this is the, the symbol for it. So this shirt. In just a few days, they broke out and Paris became... <laughs> Paris became threatened. And where are we at here? Sorry, we had a little bit of weird sound come in. So I don't think you'll be hearing anything right now. And these are the Marquis or the Free French. They rose up in Paris right before the Allies got there. And the Germans, actually were, Hitler ordered them to blow all the monuments of Paris up, like the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, or Versailles. He ordered them to blow it up, but he didn't do that. The commander on the ground decided not to do that. And even though there would be fighting in Paris, those landmarks would be saved. And on August 25th, Paris was liberated. And there's Charles de Gaulle, the head of the Free French, marching through. A French armored division of Free French would be leading the way through Paris. This really angered a lot of the Americans, especially the Americans who not only thought we did all the fighting, while the French arrived late and they only were partially in the battle, but also a lot of American soldiers were thinking, we want to be part of the liberation of Paris because we're going to have a lot of fun in Paris because there'll be a lot of people quite, uh, um, oh, wait a minute, let me show one little picture right, right here. These are free French at a barricade um, fighting the Germans. They thought the Americans would be, or the French would be so jubilant they could have a good time in Paris. But here are some American soldiers marching through the Champ de Lyon, and they literally marched through and then kept going to the front. And the Germans were in full retreat. By the way, this is what happened to French collaborators. Male collaborator, collaborators who helped the Germans, if they were caught, a lot of them would be, would be lynched. Women who collaborated by dating or even marrying German soldiers, 
they would be beaten. And here is a classic example of one, um, sh um, their head had shaved to humiliate them. France really had a difficult time because in many ways the country collaborated with the Germans. And so a lot of the collaborators were the ones who actually tried to disguise the fact by attacking other collaborators. And France never really recovered from this. What do you do to people just trying to survive and so they help the Germans? It, it's a crisis. While this is going on, to tie in with D-Day, one, well, the biggest military operation in history up to that time, Operation Bagration, the Soviet attack across central Russia into Poland. This offensive was so big, it's hard to wrap your mind around. It involved over 5 million men, tens of thousands of tanks, and devastated the Germans, absolutely pushed them back all across this line, and then eventually sweeping through the Balkans. These are Germans on the offensive. Now, in August of 1945, the Soviets would attack, they would declare war on Japan and attack Manchuria, and that's the biggest military offensive in history. At the same time, the atomic bombs were dropped. Wait, wait, I'm gonna do you something. Hmm. I wonder if those relate. Okay, so, and then they swept all the way through the Baltic states, and by the fall, they're at the gates of Warsaw, and they swept through the Balkans. Romania and Bulgaria switched sides. Hungary would be attacked, and they about switched sides, and Germany took them over. Really big fighting around Budapest. But this huge offensive, and so as big as the American and British and Canadian attack was, it did not compare to what the Soviets were doing. While that is happening, with the Soviets on the rise, Warsaw rose up. The Poles had a home guard army, and they were somewhat, they were groups of rebels who had been hoarding equipment and hiding it in Poland. And they had an exiled government in London. And when they thought the Soviets were nearby, they rose up and took much of Warsaw back from the Germans. They wanted to create a Polish government based on the government in London because they were scared Stalin would put a puppet government in there. And so these are Polish soldiers. They would use the sewer system to move troops around. Here are volunteers, and I love the picture here and here you notice these are Poles, but they're wearing captured German uniforms and helmets. Young men and women of all ages would fight and really took the Germans by shock. And I should add, when the final solution began uh, three years earlier in the Warsaw Ghetto, Jews rose up in a feudal tragic uprising to try to stop because they, they had, just had a feeling what was going to happen. And they would be brutally put down. And so some people get those two confused. This was bigger on a wide scale. And they did free uh, a couple of the concentration camps and one death camp in this process. But Stalin did not help. Stalin wanted a puppet government. So he ordered his troops to not only stop with Warsaw in sight, they could have kept going and linked up with this home army. He ordered his men to do everything they can to actively hurt the Polish Home Guard. And once the Germans realized this, these are German tanks on the advance, these are still some of the Polish Guard, they went through over the next two months, or in fact, the end of 1944, and destroyed Warsaw. They should tell you everything you need to know about Stalin. And Poland will become one of the key factors of the Cold War. Here's Warsaw, now, I put this to remind me, here's Warsaw right after the battle, devastated. Here and here, that's Warsaw in 1950. That's five years after the war ended. And Warsaw was destroyed. Just a few of the landmarks were, um, were there. Go to Warsaw today. Warsaw, there's some parts that still look medieval. Virtually all of that was rebuilt. All of that was rebuilt after the war. And so, a couple more things. First off, Hitler kept saying 
sure we're losing this war, but I have all these secret weapons, secret weapons, and they will turn the tide. And they were, to say the least, too little, too late. That's an understatement. The two most famous ones were what's called a buzz bomb. Basically, it was a flying bomb with what's called a ramjet right here. And they were called vengeance weapons. So that's V1. And it could fly about 500 miles per hour. It took off on a ramp right here and would fly. Basically, they would have it um, guided by a gyroscope, hoping to keep it on one straight path. And then the idea was they would try to time it where they would, the engine would shut off at a certain prescribed, prescribed time and the bomb would crash into hopefully, well, this is just some part of London or some part of uh, like uh, when the Allies took Antwerp for a harbor, just to drop in there. And these could be shot down and sometimes planes would come up American P-51s or British Tempest bombers and use their wings to tip that wing and it just spiral all over. And they, uh, they were a precursor to what we call a cruise missile today. But even more deadly what's called was the V-2 or Vengeance 2 rocket, the first ballistic rocket. And it was designed by a German scientist named Werner von Braun. And it was ballistically aimed, so that means it would fly in a parabola it had a range of about a thousand miles, and at least at first could hit London, and there was no defense for this. And this is the first ballistic rocket, and yes, this has caused some terror and devastation in London, but not near enough to turn the tide of the war. After the war, the Americans captured von Braun, and even though he was involved in war crimes by using slave laborers to be brutally mistreated to make his weapons, the Americans didn't care, and they would use him to help start the American space program including nasa and there he is standing in front of one of the mercury rockets and he would be instrumental in the moon landing we just kind of avoided that whole nazi connection the british or the germans also made jet fighters but they came too late to make a decisive impact in the war the allies were very fortunate that the germans nazi germany was so anti-science because it connected to jews and science doesn't necessarily have an ideology they wanted only science that directly uh, showed Nazi superiority, like the fake racial science. And so, with that, after Paris fell, Eisenhower had a choice to make. They know supply is going to be an issue. M Montgomery and the British and Canadians were in the northern part of France. Bradley and his best commander, Patton were in the south. So there's Bradley, there's Monty, and there's Ike. And who do you commit the supplies to? Both generals wanted it. Well, M Eisenhower decided on, with the Germans in full, to, full retreat, they would do what's called a broad front. They would advance on a wide front and sweep towards the German border. I should add, there was an Allied invasion in southern France, and yes, that's a part of the invasion in the bottom picture. Uh, by then, the Germans were already in full retreat, so there was some hard fighting, but they just kind of picked up the line here. This is not a daring uh, advance. And the, even though they would push and liberate all of France by September, almost all of France, they, they never were able to fully exploit the German attack. And the big reason was, the Allied supply lines were way overextended. They were still driving supplies from the beaches in Normandy to the supply line. In fact, they called the supply line the Red Ball Express. And here's a sign from it, the Red Ball Highway. Here's the trucks. And a lot of the soldiers who did this, as I remember I told you before, they had segregated units and these were black soldiers. As you can see right here, they were given the supply duties until they ran out of men. Here's filling gas tanks up. And soon it was taking a gallon of gasoline to get a gallon of gasoline to the front. And they literally ran out of supplies of the German frontier. They literally ran out of supplies. They uh, would try one more attempt, a daring use of paratroopers right here to try to break through one last gasp. 
in Holland, but that failed. It's called Market Garden. We're not going to go into detail of that. And so eventually what would happen is by the winter of 44, 45, they couldn't finish the war by Christmas and they were stuck on this line, the West Wall or the Siegfried line and began, a, 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 again, a horrible war of attrition. Bloody, awful fighting, and it just happened to be the winter of 45, 44, 45 was one of the coldest on record, and that is when American, British, Canadian, French forces had to suffer through this winter against the Germans across the line, and the Netherlands went through absolute hell as being partially occupied at that time. Here are some of the defenses along the line. And here you can see these are anti-tank defenses called Dragon's Teeth. These are Americans advancing near Metz in western France, eastern France. And look at the weather. You can see how just miserable it is. So think about always 25 to 40, freezing, getting warm. Um, and they never had the proper gear. There weren't enough replacements and reinforcements that the men were on the front line the whole time. An awful winter. And here is a picture of the Allies coming this way. And here come the Russians on the other side. While that's happening, let's have an election. The election of 1944 took place. And this is a wartime election. Haven't had a wartime election for president since the Civil War. And FDR decided to run one more time. He felt he had no choice. But conservative Democrats throughout the very liberal Henry Wallace, and they got a relatively unknown Missouri senator named Harry Truman as vice president. Relatively unknown. He was barely known to President Roosevelt. They had barely met. Uh, Roosevelt got some fame in rooting out uh, uh, some corruption by arms manufacturers during the war. And he was seen as someone who's tied to the Kansas City mob and kind of a joke. That's why Southern conservative Democrats wanted them. They thought he was a Southerner. They knew Roosevelt is getting near the end. The, Demo the Republicans would nominate the Attorney General from New York, Thomas Dewey, a relatively liberal uh, Republican. He was best known for rooting out organized crime. Well, the election, not as big a victory as previous elections, but still another sweeping Roosevelt election and he would be elected to a record fourth term. And because the Constitution would be amended soon afterwards, Republicans and conservative Democrats didn't want another Roosevelt again. That's why they limited to two terms after this. He, there will never be another one after, or we'll get four terms, unless the Constitution gets changed. So here's the situation right after the election, December 1944. The Americans are on this line. The Soviets are coming. In fact, the Soviets are right there. Here is the Ardennes Forest. Remember that forest that the Germans attacked in 1940, surprising the French. Well, the British, well, the Americans, they put some of the units that had been worn out or f new units there in the Ardennes, thinking that would be a relatively safe place in the line. A National Guard division from North Dakota literally just was put into line there. And that's when the Germans would begin their last offensive, the Battle of the Ball, which it is called. And the German plan was a massive attack here and sweep to the sea. Actually, they're hoping to get to the city, port city of Antwerp and cut the British off again. So the Battle of the Ball. And they were hoping in the winter, Allied air superiority could not be used. So split U.S. and British forces. They thought if they could split the forces up, the British and the Americans would realize the folly of their way. They thought the West would see the light and finally realize the real enemy is not Nazi Germany. The real enemy is the Soviets. And they would join the battle against the Soviets. That should give you an idea how delusional Hitler was. And so when the attack took place, my, I'm running out of battery. I forgot to plug in my computer. Just give me one sec. Okay, <laughs> so they took the Allies completely by surprise. This was a failure all the way from Eisenhower 
to Bradley, to the army commander there, a general by the name of Hodges, a complete failure. Here are Germans on the advance. Here are German, these are actually paratroopers riding a, a Panther tank. And this guy, he is in about 40 different pictures. So he must have been like this prototypical German soldier. There's all these pictures of it advancing. Here he has bullets for the squad machine gun. And they broke through the, the lines. But the Ardennes is heavily forested, mountainous. They're tied to roads. And isolated pockets of American troops held out in cities and were able to slow the German offensive down. Here are American, these, this in the forest. It was, it's a thick, heavy forest. Here's Americans on the advance reinforcements. And they were able to advance a little bit and create this very distinctive bulge in the Allied line, thus the Battle of the Bulge. Right here, a city called Bastion was able to help hold out and members of the 101st Airborne held out there. These are pictures of them. They didn't have winter gear. They were in camp at, that's really the only reserves the Allies had around Paris. And they jumped on trucks and arrived in Bastion with whatever they had. So they didn't have good white gear to be in this heavy snow. They had light canvas jackets. And I thought this is a really good picture. You can see he has wrapped his sweater around his head, around his helmet, because he is just bitterly cold. Nightmarish fighting, but they held out in Bastion. And the battling bastards of Bastion, they held out. Uh, the city in Belgium. And when the Germans surrounded it, they sent the commander of the Americans there. He's actually the second in command. The commander of the 101st Airborne was still in London. He wasn't able to get there in time. So this general named McAuliffe, who was actually the artillery commander. And they asked him to surrender. He's surrounded. And it's surrounded. It's overcast, so allied planes can't come in, at least to drop supplies or attack the Germans. And he was given this offer to surrender. Well, no way he's going to surrender. Well, he gets it and looks at this offer to surrender and doesn't know what to say. And he kind of looks at one of his, his uh, staff members and said, ah, oh, nuts. Just his kind of comment there. Well, the guy said, that's your response. What? And what do you mean? He was right, just write that down. So they got the German response and goes, and he wrote down, answer to the um, German Mont Montufel, the German general asked the, for the surrender. Response of General Montufel, nuts, Allied commander. And so that became one of the great moments of American grit and bravery. And, but if you go to Bastion today, sometimes it will be called Nut City, which sounds a little awkward, but just go with it. Well, when the weather cleared up, the Allies were able to counterattack, and this would turn into, from a humiliated defeat to the Amer greatest American victory of the war. The commander of the southern flank, George Patton, right there, he turned his army north and liberated Bastion. This is a great picture. They chalked on this Sherman tank, the first tank in the Bastion. Here's uh, Patton with uh, General McAuliffe, the 101st Airborne Commander. There's some Germans surrendering. And the last German reserves were used up. Hitler showed his insanity. The biggest threat to Germany was the Soviet army that was coming. They wanted revenge. They were going to destroy whatever Germany they had for what the Germans did to the Soviet Union. And the best chance the Germans had for peace agreement was the British and the Americans. But he, in his delusion, not only thought that they would help join, the Allies would join the Russians, which of course would never have happened. He didn't care what happened in the post-war world to Germany. He figured if he died, Germany is dead and all Germans deserve to die because they should have fought harder. That should give you an idea how insane it is, but also the mindset of an authoritarian dictator. All that matters is them, themselves. They care about nobody else and German soldiers and German people were nothing but fodder for machine guns for Hitler if he needed it to be. And so after that, this shows the floods opening as the German or the Soviets and the Allies are ready to come as soon as winter ends. Oh, I should add, you see this little inner fortress? This was the great fear. The great fear of the Germans. 
that they would, or the allies, that they would form this, it's called a Bavarian Redoubt right there. So let's go ahead and finish this part. So with that, March 1945, March 1945 would be the final offensive, as soon as winter ended. This map does not show it very well, but they finally broke through the West Wall and advanced to the Rhine River. Now, the Germans along the Rhine River right here destroyed every bridge on it except for one. One bridge, the order wasn't given, and the bridge didn't blow up. And so the Allies had advanced here, broke through and advanced to the Rhine, and then here's uh, fighting, for example, in Cologne, where some of the most dramatic tank-to-tank -tank fighting in history would be would take place here is a German Panther tank destroyed right in front of the Great Cathedral. Cologne would be destroyed. Here is a new American Pershing tank right here. Would be destroyed in battle, but somehow the beautiful cathedral survived. You notice the bridge over the Rhine destroyed. But one bridge at a place called Remagen was captured, and Bradley threw troops over it. The Germans were able to stop them on this side of the beach even though they built some pontoon bridges. But that would set up other crossings of the Rhine. Those are British ready to cross, those are Americans to cross. And once the Rhine was crossed, the Germans could not last long. Eisenhower decided then to allow the Soviets to take Berlin. It was going to be in the Soviet occupation zone. And he figured, well, let the Soviets take it. He was more worried about down here the thinking of a Bavarian redoubt. So as they exploded through, and there's still some isolated pockets of German fighting, Berlin would be going to the Russians. While that's happening, there were liberations of the concentration camps. And these concentration camps, uh, well, actually, the fall before, the death camps had been liberated by the Soviets. And now, concentration camps were being liberated. The, the few remaining people in the death camps were marched in what they called death marches, meaning were starved or killed along the way into Germany to work in these slave labor camps. But these were political prisoners. Some had been there since 33 if they survived. Some were children, as seen right here. Here are Soviets 